thank you, Lord, for the greatness of your word and for the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for utterance today in the Holy Ghost. Think through my mind, speak through my lips. And Lord, we pray that your word would have a spectacular in, uh, effect upon each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I want to start this morning in Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 20. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that found them, and health or medicine to all their flesh. Folks, I want you to realize that there's a progressive nature to the Word of God. By that I mean the more we hear the Word of God, the more we focus our attention on the Word, the more re uh, revealing it becomes, the more revelation comes to us. It's uh, an adding to. Every time we hear the Word of God, it should be adding to what we've heard before. Now we usually stop in verse 22 when, we're, when we use these scriptures, but let's keep reading for another couple of verses. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now the heart he's talking about here is talking about referring to the inner man, the spirit of man. Notice it says from our heart come the issues of life. This word issue means force, spiritual forces are a result of the thing or the a byproduct of our spirit operating in the Word of God. Now answer me this. If the Word of God is the answer, and in the preceding verses we saw that, if their life and health are medicine to all of our flesh, how could we, as believers, get the results of the word and experience the blessings that God's word promises to us if we don't know that we're spirit beings. How much of the church world focuses on the fact that we are spirit beings and that from our lips, our words spoken from our hearts, our spirit, bring us into victory. If we don't know that we're spirit beings and we don't know how to operate these spiritual forces are, are set in motion, these spiritual forces that bring us life and victory, then how can the church be expected to live in that victory? There's so much of what the church world, by and large, ignores concerning the truth of who we are concerning how the kingdom of God operates here in this earth. Things that other churches, other groups, other denominations would consider to be unimportant are in fact the very source of life and blessing. Keep thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues or spiritual forces of life that result in life. Put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. How in the world are we to operate in these spiritual forces? Well, the verse, the verse that we just read tells us it has to do with our words. Put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look straight on, right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. I'm, yeah, Mark chapter 4. Beginning in verse 1, And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship, and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, now remember in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, it tells us that Jesus 
was teaching the people and they were astonished at his doctrine. They were astonished at his teaching. Not, they weren't astonished at him. They were astonished at his doctrine. Verse 29 goes on to say why. For he taught them at how to hold authority and not as the scribes. He taught them Jesus' doctrine that astonished the hearers was that man has authority on the earth. He didn't teach he had authority. He taught that man had authority on the earth. Well, we know that to be true from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. On the sixth day of creation, God said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness and let them have dominion over the works of our hands. He gave God, God gave man dominion. The reason he gave man dominion on the earth is because he wanted man to have dominion on the earth. And the fall of man didn't change that. God's the same now as he was when before Adam sinned. If he wanted man to have authority on the earth then, he wants him to have authority on the earth now because God never changes. So he taught them many things by or through parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony, stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some thirty and some sixty and some a hundred. And he said unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. In other words, he's saying there is a way to understand this parable. But it takes the full commitment of your heart to God. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked him of the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. The mystery of the kingdom of God. Now remember when Jesus was approached by his disciples, they asked him to teach them to pray. They said the disciples of John were taught by John how to pray. So teach us to pray. And Jesus gave what is known as the Lord's Prayer, it really was disciples' prayer. It wasn't a prayer for the New Testament, although it has some great information and some great principles in there. But Jesus taught them, gave them the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, so the kingdom of God hadn't yet come at that point in time. It has since come because Jesus was sacrificed and raised again from the dead. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the kingdom of God is where the will of God is done on the earth just like it is in heaven. And Jesus said here, unto you it is given up to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. There's a mystery about the kingdom of God. There's a mystery, something that's not available, uh, readily available to each and every person. It's, in, it's potentially available to them, but again, it takes commitment and understanding of how this kingdom of God works. So he said, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So this parable of the sower sowing the word is the key to having the will of God in your life here on the earth just like you'll have it in heaven. He's identifying this as the single key to understand how to walk in the blessings of God in this earth. Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Now, it sounds like Jesus is saying that God doesn't want everybody to be saved. We know that's not the case because it would contradict the word. The Bible says Jesus was slain for the world, the whole world from the beginning of time, from the foundations of the earth. 
the Bible says God always uh, desires for every man to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So what is he saying? Did you notice it said to those that are without? In other words, he's talking about those that are not willing to commit themselves 100% to him and to the Lord. The type of life, the Christian life, that so many in the church world are experiencing and partaking in at this point in time, certainly they're true because they believe, they're saved because they believe in the truth of the word concerning Jesus' resurrection. But salvation as far as, is as far as a lot of people want to go. Some people, if they found out the truth of the word and heard the word preached in other areas and, and understood, came to understand how things were, he would want that for them as well. But God's looking for a full all-in commitment. There's a lot of the church world that wants the best, God's best in, for them and in their lives. But they don't want to do what it takes to get God's best. They won't give God their best. But they want God to give them his best. Folks, it's an all-in commitment with God. Amen. If you're going to walk in the blessings of the word. If you're going to walk in fullness and the power that the name of Jesus brings to us, it's going to take an all-in commitment. Verse 13, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? So not only is this sower sowing the word parable, the key to understanding the mystery of God is the key to understanding every other parable as well. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word was sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise who are stone, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Notice it says they have no root in themselves. That root, that word that's translated root, really means moisture. In other words, they didn't continue to water the word. How do you continue to water the word? Well, the way you take hold of the word of God is by speaking it, accepting it in your heart and speaking and saying what God said. You water it the same way, by continuing to speak his word. And notice he says, because there is no continued watering of the word, affliction and persecution arise and causes the people to be offended, which really just means they give up on the word and turn loose. Now the word affliction means pressure. When pressure comes, it also means trouble. So Jesus is telling us very specifically, here's what you can expect when you take a hold of the word. You can expect trouble, meaning circumstances will align themselves against you. There'll be pressure in any number of ways that's designed to make you turn loose of the truth that you've embraced. And there'll be persecution or opposition. Now folks, I can't tell you how many times people have come to me over the years and declared that they were turning loose of the word because it couldn't be true. And their reason for saying that it wasn't true was they tried it for a few days and it didn't work. I've also had a number of people through the years complain about the pressure that arose once they started acting on the word. I've had people say the devil never gave me this much trouble any other time before I started work, uh, approaching the word and confessing the word in my life. Well, duh. 
You never were a threat to the devil before you started quoting the word. So he says that affliction and persecution, pressure, trouble, and opposition are standard fare for those that choose to accept the word of God and begin to act on it by speaking it. Then he goes further. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now let's talk about this one for a little bit. The care of this world, or cares of this world, the lusts of other things, and the deceitfulness of riches, are designed by the devil to choke the word and keep it from producing results in your life. Now the cares of this world, I think I've always, up until the last few years, I've always looked at that as just being things that people worry about. They worry about if they're going to have enough money to pay their rent. They worry about are they going to catch some disease. They worry about things going wrong in their lives. And I always just assumed that those were the cares of this world. But these last few years have shown me that there's a lot of cares of this world that I didn't consider before. We can certainly include this pandemic, this COVID virus, to be included in the cares of this world. And look how much the world has changed since January of last year. January 2020 simply because of a virus that had a kill rate of less than 1%. We have experienced economic suicide through the lockdowns associated with this pandemic. We've experienced lies and misinformation about what treatment was affected concerning this pandemic. We've experienced outright lies from the government and from so much of the medical community about how many people were dying from this disease. You may remember in May of last year, the death rate was identified to be 145,000. And there were a couple of people, one from an unlikely source in the Center for Disease, the CDC, who identified that even at the time, the counting, the death toll counting was in error. And they identified that only eight or nine percent of that 145,000 at that time were really killed by the, uh, by the COVID virus. Well, what impact did that have on the count? Absolutely none. The count just kept going up from 145,000 to whatever it is now. I saw something the other day that said it was 4 million worldwide. But then I also saw an article where somebody in the, the uh, medical community in California revisited the county and the procedure for the county that makes up the death toll. And they said at the time, this was a couple of weeks back. They said that they've identified that clearly 50% and more of those that were identified in the death rate or the death toll from, um, from COVID were in error. Well, what'd they do with that? Absolutely nothing. We've got the vaccines that are being pushed by the government and the medical community. 
and nobody has any clear-cut but definitive information on how safe that is. Well, these are cares of the world. And the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Folks, these things are all designed by the devil to distract you, to get you more concerned about things in this life, things in the physical realm, than the truth of the word of God, which when spoken from our hearts, brings forth life and blessing. So what are we to do with these things? We are approaching the end when Jesus comes back to receive us unto himself in such a way that the things that are normal for us now and the things that we're experiencing would not even have been able to gain the traction that it has over the last five years. Just five years ago, some of the things that have taken place, the riots and the violence, the protests, couldn't have even occurred just as short a time as five years ago. But now we've got defund the police while the violence continues, we've got cities and states whose prosecutors have identified that they will not pursue crime and different types of crime, looting, stealing, and so forth. And somehow or another, that's supposed to be okay. I take a special notice in the lawlessness that's taking place because that's one of the names of the Antichrist. He's called the lawless one. It's not uh, uh, translated that way in the King James, but he's called the lawless one. Well, it stands to reason that the world that would receive the lawless one would be lawless themselves. And then we've got the importance, the absolute importance or necessity being shared with us through the news media about transgenders and their right to invade girls' locker rooms and the need to have a transgender participate in the Olympics to represent America. How long ago would it, how far back would we have to go to find that that would not be accepted? Not too far, really. So folks, I want you to understand that Jesus is saying that the word of God and the blessings that result from keeping his word will bring life and victory over all of these things. Brother Hagin said something in a private setting when I used to work with him about the healing revival. The healing revival started in 1947 and went to about 1957. And according to Brother Hagin, he said it was the easiest thing in the world to get people healed during that period of time just because that's the way the Holy Ghost was moving.
and he stopped in what he was saying and said to the rest of us, there was a few of us sitting around the table, he said, you know, there was something that contributed to the healing revival. And that was people had a higher level of faith back then than they do now. Now, the, the now that he was talking about was probably 1984, maybe, 1983, when he was telling us these things. But he said there was a higher level of faith in churches that spilled over into these crusades, healing campaigns, many of them, uh, not Brother Hagen, but many of them were in tent meetings and stuff like that. But he said there was a higher level of faith on the part of the people. And he said, we asked him what he tr attributed that to. And he said, people didn't have as many distractions back then. Now folks, when you compare the distractions in 1983 or 84 with the present day, things have accelerated and multiplied greatly to the day that we're living in now. One of the things that I've thought about and I don't mean this seriously, but it amazes me that Paul would have told the church that one of the characteristics of the last days would be the devil's crowd would command that people abstain from meat. Now you've got this push going on with this plant-based meat, protein, whatever it's supposed to be. I've never had one, never hoped to have one. <laughs> but why wouldn't the Holy Ghost tell Paul that in the last days people would be stuck on their smartphones? <laughs> but they own good ground. These are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put up brought to be put under a bushel or under a, a bed, and not to be set on the candlestick? For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Second time he says that concerning this parable. So when he's talking about the candle being set on the candlestick, what is he referring to? He's talking about putting the word first in your life. He's talking about being all in, totally committed to God and his word. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. What are we to hear? Well, we're to hear the importance of putting the Word of God first place in our lives. And no matter what else is going on around us, no matter whether things seem to get better or worse, keep God's Word first. Now, I've said a lot about some of the political things that are going on, the Black Lives Matter, the uh, Antifa protests and violence and all that kind of stuff. And I've been accused of not being sympathetic to the racism that some people think is going on in the country. And folks, I've got to tell you, I'm sympathetic to anybody that's been involved in some injustice. But I'm not going to change my pursuit of God and His Word just to show sympathy. For example, I could take this medical diagnosis that they've given me, and I could talk to you about the symptoms and the pain that's involved with some of it, and tell you enough about the physical aspect. that I've been dealing with for 10 years. 
And I can tell you that how difficult it has been and give you some of the specifics. And I'm sure that I could elicit some sympathy, at least from the people in this crowd. But what good would that do? That would simply put you and me both in a position where we're spreading the devil's influence and agreeing with his agenda instead of taking the word of God and standing on it. So quite frankly, if I chose to take that position, which many people do, many Christians take sickness and disease as being God's will for their lives, whether they know why it would have happened or not. But your sympathy, coupled with my unbelief, could lead me to an early grave. You know, some of the people that have left us over this Black Lives Matter stuff as well as other comments that I've made about politics. I'm really concerned for those people. And here's why. Just as we saw in Proverbs chapter 4, that there's a progression, a progressive nature to the Word of God, a positive progression of revelation, the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Well, if faith comes by hearing, faith goes by not hearing. And I've seen over the years people that left us for whatever reason. I think I've heard just about every reason there is in the book. And I've watched some of the, the results in those people's lives over a matter of years in some cases. For a while after they leave, it doesn't seem like there's any change or any difference. But the longer they are gone and the more they've separated themselves from hearing the word, it begins to take shape and show up in their lives. Folks, there are a lot of results. A lot of the blessings of God that we set ourselves in position to take hold of and to receive, which may be which may go against or beyond the specific thing that we're praying for. For example, when the Bible talks about bring all the tithes into the storehouse. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there's not room enough to receive. That blessing that there's not room enough to receive has got to be something more than money. You and I will never get to the place where we can't receive more money. You'll never get a call from your bank saying, I'm sorry, we can't take any more deposits into your account. So that blessing that there's not room enough to receive, must be blessings in other areas that come as a result of trusting God with our money. Things that we may not have even thought about believing for. Protection, for example. I've seen over and over and over again how people were protected in their lives in some other way than just financial because they put God first with their money. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 24, And he said unto them, Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet shall it be measured to you again. And unto you that hear shall more be given. Again, he's talking about being sold out to God, sold out to his word. 
Don't let anything distract you and take, turn you away from what the Word says. Because God's Word is true no matter what circumstances arise. No matter who does what in this world around us. Verse 25, for he that hath, meaning ears to hear, to him shall be given. And he that has not, from him shall be taken away even that which he has. And he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground. Now remember, the kingdom of God is where the will of God is done in the earth, in your life, just like it will be when you get to heaven. So he says, here's what the kingdom of God is like. It's as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. I'm so glad we don't have to know how every little thing works or is going to work or whatever. It works because it's God's word. It works because we speak his word into our lives. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. And he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, where the will of God is done in your life here on the earth, just like it is in heaven? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Jesus wanted them to know what he was saying. He wanted them to understand how the kingdom of God works. He wanted them to walk in the blessings of God in their lives. Just like he wants the same thing for you and me. Brother Hagin said something else. It was in healing school just a month or two after I got to school started attending school at Raymond. And I don't remember exactly what he was talking about, what his subject was, but he's ministering something along the lines of faith and healing. And then he stopped and he said this. He said, I feel sorry for people that have always had things easy. And I remember thinking, not me. I've always wanted to be one of those people where, that, that had things easy. But he finished, he went on to say, I feel sorry for people that have always had things easy in life. He said, because they never understand what it is to be able to trust God and find God faithful. Yes. You know, I think one of the things that we overlook about the greatness of God is how God knows what is the right time and the right way to reach people? He found me just at the right time. I was at a place in my life where I didn't have any direction. There were a couple of opportunities that were available to me. And I hadn't decided whether I was gonna do anything with those opportunities. And either one of the several opportunities that were available to me at the time would have set my life on a completely different course than the course I'm on now. And the circumstances surrounding how he reached me how he drew my attention to the word and put a desire on the inside of me to walk in the fullness of God's word and the fullness of his blessings were just completely supernatural. 
God knows how to reach each person. If they'll only be allow themselves to be reached. Turn with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Now, I'm sure the translators had a, a great time with the first part of this verse. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. What does that mean? Well, let's use this term, which will encompass the, the true meaning of the words that are used. He's saying, quit holding back from God. Go all in with your heavenly Father. Allow yourself or determine to be com completely committed to Him and receive with meekness. What does the sold out life look? Like a life that's sold out completely to God is a life whose focus and purpose becomes the Word of God itself. Receive with meekness the engrafted Word, which is able to save your souls. He's talking about the renewing of the mind. But be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goeth his way, and straightway forget what, forgetteth what manner of man he was. Now this word forget means to lose out of mind. In other words, to allow something else to occupy your thoughts. But notice the phrase, forgetteth what manner of man he was. Do you see that? These words that are translated from the Greek into the English literally means a quality of life. It's talking about a quality of life. One translation translates it like this. And forgetting the high quality of excellence that he was. See, James isn't just saying that somebody forgets what the word says about them, but instead allows his mind to lose focus on the fact that he is God's best and that most excellent creation. It's a phrase that's talking about the authority of man. The hearer and not the doer goes his own way, implying that he's not following God's way. And straightway, very soon, immediately, forgets the excellence of the quality in which God made him. We're taught very much by religion that we are nothing. But folks, God wouldn't have sent his son Jesus to die on the earth for nothings. Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about an ego boost here. I'm talking about a clear understanding of what the Bible says about who we are, who he created us to be. And even in man's fallen state, the fact that he has authority on the earth. But especially for those of us that have been born again, been made new creatures in Christ Jesus, who have renewed our minds to the truth of God's word. Folks, that's not nothing and never will be. The Bible says we have the same righteousness as Jesus himself. That's not nothing. 
The Bible says we have the power of the name of Jesus to do the same works that he did here on the earth. That's not nothing. God created man in such a manner. And he's redeemed man in such a manner that is of the highest quality of excellence of anything in the universe. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Notice he's talking about continuing in the word. Putting the word first place, in other words. Being completely sold out to God and his word. And notice that this mirror that we look in is the perfect law of liberty. It's the source of every freedom it's the power to make us free in every way. It's the spiritual force and the source of the spiritual forces that bring us into victory in every aspect of life. Folks, the Word's got the answer for you no matter what your problem is. Speaking God's Word will change your circumstances to align with every blessing that God has declared for you and me throughout the scripture. Verse 26, he goes on to say, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. This word religion means, to, uh, means a ceremonial process. It's really talking about worshipers of God. If anybody seems to be a worshiper of God, but doesn't control his tongue, this man's religion, this man's worship of God is vain. In every case, in every situation, it's talking about the importance of speaking God's word. It's talking about the importance of controlling your tongue. One of the most significant things, probably the most significant thing that took place and happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned was they lost control of their tongue. Up to that point, up to the appearance of sin, their tongues were controlled by the things that they had heard from God, the things that were in their hearts. But when they sinned, Immediately they began to speak according to the physical circumstances and what was going on in the physical realm around them. That's why renewing the mind is so important because it brings us back to the place where we begin or should we say begin again to say what God says. Those you are who God says you are. You can do what God says you can do. You can become what God says you can become. Because the greatest spiritual force in the universe, the Word of God says so. If any man among you seems to be a worshiper of God and the bridle's not his tongue, he deceives his own heart. And this man's worship of God is vain. Folks, we've got the answer for any problem that arises. We've got the cure for any disease or pandemic that comes along.
We simply have to be on guard to refuse to allow pressure or trouble or opposition or the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the lust or the desires for other things. All we have to do is keep those things from distracting us and we will have exactly what we say. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you not only because it's true, but because you have shared it with us. Therefore, Father, we say we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We say we are healed by his stripes. We say the chastisement of our peace, our well-being, our prosperity is upon him. And we say, Father, that the peace of God keeps us and holds us steady. No matter what goes on around us, we walk in victory. No matter what the devil does or how he rises up against us, we are victorious. We say that we are pursued and overtaken by the blessings of God in such a manner that there's not room enough to receive all that he has done. Because we're tithers, because we've been, we've determined to commit ourselves to the Lord in every way. Father, we thank you for the great work that you do in us as individuals and the great plan that you have for our church. A plan for the last days. A plan of victory. A plan of blessings. A plan of healings and miracles. A plan that reveals the goodness of God in every possible way. We love you, Lord. And we commit ourselves to you 100%. We commit our lives to your word 100%. In Jesus' precious name, and everybody that agrees with that, say amen.